Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. This is episode number 41, uh, being recorded April 26th. Uh, I got a batch of questions here. Ryan's uh, traveling somewhere. He's always traveling, man. Um, but Jim has been nice enough to compile a short list of storage questions, storage-specific questions for me. Uh, so here we go. Um, Meatball CB. Uh, do you have any suggestions for a budget-friendly way to build out a 30, 45, or 60 SATA drive storage array similar to the 45 drive Stornator. Uh, I'm totally with you. Uh, Stornator is, uh, looks like a really cool thing. Uh, you know, I'm sure in practice it's a really cool thing, ability to just pile a whole crap load of uh, hard drives into one big array. Um, and even with the Stornators, you can actually like stack them, like multiple Stornators, and still have them as like a huge combined array. Um, but trying to do that on the cheap is a different story entirely. Um, I have some plans to do a similar kind of thing. Um, I want to do this arcade cabinet build I've been talking about doing for years. It just, uh, it's taken me forever to get there. But, uh, the way that I plan to save money on my intended build is I'm going to make my own drive cage. Um, and I'm going to kind of cheap out and make it so that it's not like the perfect hot swap capable thing. I'm just going to make it so that there are connectors at the rear of the drive that basically you put the drive where it needs to go and then you would still have to plug it in. Um, but you can get reasonably low cost, um, raid cards. If you look on eBay and you find, you know, find a decent raid card manufacturer, go a few generations back though. Um, you, as you find like enterprise grade hardware uh generally even several generations ago is still going to be just fine uh as far as raid cards and hbas go um when it comes to just you're just plugging in sata hard drives right like you know you don't need blistering speed you don't need serial attached scuzzy you don't need uh you know 12 gigabit per second you're just worried about hard drive speeds um I've personally found that you can go back uh, three or four generations on uh, this company called Arika that makes raid cards. You'll find people decommissioning old servers all the time on eBay. And I mean, I've picked up some of those cards, like 24 port versions of those cards uh, for like 150, 200 bucks, stuff like that. Um, so, and you can run those in JBOD mode. So they'll basically just act like a host bus adapter. Uh, they, Arika hardware at least has uh, drivers going back way far, way far back uh, for, as far as hardware goes. Um, but their drivers are very good for handling like Linux and, you know, any kind of uh, any kind of other OS as you might think. They pretty much have it covered as far as driver support goes. So you're good on all those fronts. You just have to find, you know, don't go back way too far on hardware generations, but at least go to like six gigabit SATA capable hardware. And their 24 port cards will generally be like a mini SAS connector. Um, and those cards are actually SAS capable, um, even though they're also backwards compatible with, with SATA. Um, so you're fine there as well. But uh, the, the more expensive thing for a build like that is just coming up with the cables, right? Like you have to order these cables that are SAS to SATA breakout cables, um, where you have, you know, the mini SAS connector is four channels in one connector. Um, they did that because it was just ridiculous to have a RAID card with, you know, 24 individual SATA plugs on it and 24 SATA cables and whatnot. So you get those breakout cables. Those tend to run about 20 bucks each. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's silly to think, but for a 24 port card, uh, you're potentially spending just as much on the cables as you're on the card. But at the end of the day, you've now, you're now able to connect 24 drives to a system through a single card um, and you can do so having a hardware raid capable, like, because the card has hardware to do all the hardware raid stuff in the background. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, for that, for that around 300 bucks, you got 24 drives. So that's way cheaper for 24 drives to a single system than any of like the Storinator type hardware. Cause that, that hardware runs all like up, upward in the thousands. Um, there's another uh, possible way you can go if you want to do all of your rating in software in the OS, no matter what. Um, um, let me look it up. Here we go. Uh, 
trying to remember the brand that makes it. There is a 40, um, there is a 40 port SATA card that exists. Um, it is the High Point Rocket 750. Um, so that card is not, I don't believe it does RAID. It's just a host bus adapter. It's just a thing meant for connecting a bunch of drives to your system. But that card, more pricey, uh, granted, they run about 750 bucks, and they're actually kind of hard to come by sometimes because they didn't sell a lot of them because it's kind of a niche thing, connecting 40 drives to a single card. But, I mean, you're, you're talking about 45 drives comparison, so that'll get you 40 on a single card. Um, you still got to buy those breakout cables. You still got to figure out a way to connect them to all the drives. But uh, that's another option. Me, personally, I would prefer to just buy a couple of older Arica you know, 24 port cards and at least try to get me, you know, that gets me to 48, right? Um, the, the plan that I have for my crazy arcade cabinet build, I, I have like four of those 24 port Arica cards, older ones. Um, and I plan on just having like a side of an arcade cabinet that I can just basically throw as many hard drives at as I want to, uh, and just expand over time. Anyway, that's that's the best I've got for trying to compete with a Storinator. Um, other than that, you know, realize the Storinator thing is like it, that is a pre-built, like ready-to-go system. So, in that respect, if you don't want to deal with the hassle of all the DIY stuff, then yeah, you gotta you gotta spend the extra money. Um, Robert asks, uh, when will large capacity one terabyte and up SSDs come down to a more reasonable price? Drives up to 500 gig are pretty reasonable, but uh, prices skyrocket when you go larger. I want to get all, I want to get uh, off of spinning discs, or he wants to get all the spinning discs out of his rigs, um, but the large capacity SSDs just aren't cost effective. So, Robert, the thing you got to realize is uh, what's killing you there is not that the prices are skyrocketing, uh, it's that the, the cost per gig is relatively constant. Um, and that also applies to hard drives, it's just that the cost per gig is way lower for hard drives. Um, so for SSDs, that 500 gig SSD might cost you a couple hundred bucks, right? Uh, however, the one terabyte SSD is going to cost you ex almost exactly double that. It's going to be like 400 bucks. And if you want two terabytes, it's going to be like 800 bucks. Um, so it's, it's not that they're like exponentially going up or anything like that. It's just that the, the price for a given amount of solid state storage is relatively fixed, um, within a given product line. It usually stays pretty, pretty constant. Um, so, you know, there's ways around that, uh, as far as trying to find SSDs that are lower, uh, cost per gig, right? There's a uh, Micron makes an 1100 SSD that we've seen on sale recently at running around 16 cents a gig, which is really, really dang low relative to, you know, for solid state storage. Um, it's not going to be as fast as the M.2 SSD naturally as it's, it's, it's a SATA SSD. Um, but if you're able to get that for that low of a cost, um, you know, might be worth looking at. Uh, and they sell those drives that we just, we just picked up like a two terabyte model for use around the office. Not even a review sample, like we just needed some extra storage. So we just bought the drive. It was that, you know, that cost effective. Um, I actually, we don't have a review of it up yet. Um, but I ran it through our suite and it was doing pretty reasonable, uh, you know, pretty reasonable speeds for a SATA SSD. So there's one way you might go if you're just looking for uh, you know better ways to get off of your uh, off of your spinning discs. Just remember, uh, keep those spinning discs around. Uh, stick them in a NAS and stick them in like a closet somewhere, and make that your backup if you don't already have a backup. Because even though you you move to SSD, there's no moving parts. Uh, there are still failure rates, so just don't forget that point. Um, Venger or Venger, not sure how to say that one. Do SSDs have any effect in games besides load times? I've heard that games like The Witcher 3 has uh, increased frames per second due to streaming assets. Uh, if this is true, does it then does it... Uh, if this is true, does it then just depend on the game engine that is being used? Absolutely, totally depends on the game engine. Uh, lots of games uh, don't stream anything. They're only loading their assets. They load everything into RAM and then you play your level. Um, a lot of games are that way, but there are games that stream on the fly. Uh, and in the case of that Witcher Three, I I would suspect that the whatever the benchmark or whatever the uh, tester was doing 
uh, and saw lower FPS due to the you know streaming and the you know loading on the fly sort of stuff. Uh, it's probably an average FPS drop over whatever that run that was you know also included streaming. Um, the thing those tests tend to not show is like how bad is the streaming event, right? Like, does the game do it? Like, is it like Portal? Portal sort of streams on the fly and tries to cloak it into like a level, you know, like a transition between levels as an example, right? It tries to do it as seamlessly as possible. But I would imagine games uh, still, even in modern day, tend to be written to be able to run on a hard disk. So the developers will probably put those loads in any place where there might be a stutter or just a pause. They'll put them in a place where the user like will tend to not care as much. Um, so if you're playing Witcher 3 and those pauses are happening where you don't care if it's an extra like half a second, um, then you don't really have to split hairs that badly for you know just how fast that SSD in, is and how much of an effect on on the average frame rate over the whole game, right? Because if it if it's stuttered and its frame rate paused during a place where you just didn't care anyway, what's it to you, right? Um, so that's just what you have to consider um, on that sort of thing. And, you know, just take that into consideration when buying your SSD. If you're, if you're not playing games, or if you're playing games that you know that the level loads or the streaming loads, you know, doesn't really uh, impact you either way, you don't care that much for that extra second of time every so often or whatever, uh, you know, then go with the cheaper SSD. It doesn't need to be the fire-breathing, you know, super awesome uh, SSD. Now, if you're trying to do um, speed runs and you're trying to play games that are doing things on the fly, streaming assets and whatnot, and you need the absolute fastest loads possible because you're doing a speed run that's actually a, you know, front to back, like just regular timed speed run, as opposed to nowadays there are tricks where you can, you know, have timing tools that exclude the loads and stuff like that, but there are still speedrunners that are going to go front to back through a game, or they're going to do um, they're going to do a game that's uh, you know like a save game plus sort of uh, speed run, which means you're basically reloading the save of all the different levels of the game. Like people do that with Doom. Um, then you do care about like the absolute storage speed for those cases um, because you're you know every every fraction of a second counts for those guys. Um, so yeah, again, that's that's probably the best I can offer at the moment. Uh, without getting specific to, you know, any particular games. Um, okay. Um, El Capitan 008. I have a Seagate 4 terabyte SSHD uh, that combines 5900 RPM disk with an 8 gig cache. Yep, that's the that's SSHDs for you. We've actually tested, if not that model, one very close to it in the past, like years back. Uh, I use it primarily for my Steam library. Smart move. Uh, I've recommended that drive for that that type of thing in the past. Would it be possible or reasonable to purchase the upcoming 64 gig Optane drive, uh, install it in my Z370 motherboard M.2 slot, use it as cache for my SSHD, or would the Optane drive or Optane cache conflict with the SSD, SSD, eh, SSHD's onboard cache? For reference, my boot drive is a Samsung 960 Evo. All right, so you're booting off a 960 Evo. That's fine for your boot drive. Um, you know, it's a reasonably fast SSD. Uh, you're kind of splitting hairs on, you know, trying to Optane cache that. Um, so I would just stick with that. Good move. Uh, yes, the new Optane memory driver is supposed to be able to cache secondary drives. It should be able to cache that SSHD that you're talking about. Uh, once you do that, here's what happens. Um, the Optane memory driver sees the frequently accessed stuff on your system. And in this case, frequently accessed stuff from the SSHD. Uh, and it puts it in the Optane memory cache. It puts a copy of it there. Uh, future uh, accesses of that data will come from Optane and will skip the SSHD. So here's what will happen. So that will speed up your uh, 64 gig worth of your frequently accessed things from your Steam drive. Here's what will happen with the SSHD as far as its 8 gig cache. That cache will no longer see what used to be the frequently accessed things. Uh, so what the cache will end up seeing is the more rarely accessed things that are not in the Optane cache. They will then hit the SSHD because the system needs to get it from somewhere. 
Uh, so that 8 gig of cache layer will end up just sort of naturally ending up as like the next tier worth of caching. Um, the stuff that that's going to end up there is going to be less frequently accessed as far as the Optane memory cache goes, but it's going to be more frequently accessed as far as what's left, what's left over, and what's being accessed uh, from the SSHD. Um, so you still see a benefit. It's just that most of the benefit is going to shift over to Optane, and then you know some of the leftovers will still have a chance of not being hard disk speed. Uh, you know which. Honestly, when you go from Optane to straight hard disk speed, that's like hitting a brick wall. Um, so at least you'll still have some cache there to help you out. Uh, as far as conflicts, there's, it's going to be seamless. There's no, nothing will conflict with anything else. SSHDs present themselves as a regular hard disk. There's, you know, the, that's the whole point of that cache on those. It's supposed to be seamless. There's no extra configuration. There's the, the operating system even has no idea that that cache is there. Um, on, on the SSHD. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's fine. Uh, totally do it. You know, it's it's sort of a tiered caching thing that you're going to end up pulling off there, and I'm sure it'll work out um, very well for you. Uh, another point worth bringing up is if you're worried about the price on the 64 gig Optane drive, when we did a bunch of testing on 32 gig and 16 gig Optane memory, um, I found that I was able to load like some pretty beefy stuff you know, like a launch Ashes of the Singularity and launching Doom and like reinstalling Office and doing a bunch of like kind of trying to push it, push the limits of the cache. 32 gig, in my experience, was pretty darn good. Um, you know, doing a bunch of really power usury, moving a bunch of stuff around kind of, kind of activities. Uh, I did not observe, you know, I barely observed any uh, roll off. In other words, things falling off of that, that 32 gig worth of cache turns out the Optane memory driver is actually really intelligent about only putting the stuff that's a more of a random activity uh, and, you know, small access activity into the Optane cache, meaning it takes a lot more uh, to fill it up, right? Um, you know, if you, if you launch it, if you have a game that is a 32 gigabyte download, that doesn't mean that just playing the game a couple of times is going to instantly fill all of the Optane 32 gig. It's only going to be pulling the bits and pieces that would be the kind of thing that would that would load more slowly from a hard disk uh, and stick it in there. So, it, you know, it gets you more bang for your buck. Um, there, There is um, the 64 gig, the upcoming one, is also an upcoming revision to the whole Optane memory line. What they're doing is they're adding the power management stuff that came out with the 800p because it's basically the identical drive, just slightly different, slight, slight tweaks. Um, if you're in a desktop system and you don't really care about the the Optane memory drive, you know, using a couple of watts extra power constantly, um, and it really it was literally like a couple of watts. It's not it's not bad. Um, if you're fine with that, look around for sales on maybe the previous generation 32 gig part. Uh, you might find it for a, a heck of a deal once the new generation stuff comes out. If you're looking for a deal at all, if you don't care, get the 64 gig and you know, be happy. Uh, all right, uh, next, Paul Bailey. I have a couple of mechanical hard drives that cannot be recognized by the computer most of the time, as is with failed hard drives. Um, and in the off chance that they are recognized, I can't do anything with them. Also a you know, symptom of a failed hard drive. I just want to format them and don't care about the data on the drives, but every format program I've searched for seems to be focused on data recovery. What can I do to just format these drives? It sounds like you are in the similar boat as what Ryan was in uh, a while back. He cleaned out like his old office in his house and he had this huge box full of hard disks. And he's like, I don't know. I just want to get rid of these. But the problem is you don't want the data that's on them getting into other hands. I suspect that's probably the case that you're in. Like, I don't think you intend to try to use these hard drives and because they're clearly not reliable anymore. But you also don't want to just throw them in the trash because somebody, you know, with the right tools could get their hands on them and do the data recovery. I hate to say this. Uh, you take your, find a drill or a drill press and drill through where the disk is in the drive. Uh, that's it. Data recovery place, probably going to write that off uh, and not get the data back. Um, yes, I know you can't erase it the normal way, but just physically kill the thing and call it good, uh, you know, and then and then just move on. If you're just trying to get rid of them and, and you want them out of your life. Um, 
or uh, if you have a local place, we have some local places that are like um, like computer recycling, hardware recycling places. And if you go there and you know what their process is, and you have a, and you have enough of a comfort level there, then you can just give them the drives and you know just trust that they're gonna break them down into their base components and you know recycle them. Um, but that's your call. Uh, Igor asks, I recently bought a four terabyte Western Digital MyBook external drive to use as backup, and before putting it into its role, I wanted to benchmark it and make sure everything is kosher. At that point, I realized that HDTune doesn't support drives larger than 2.2 terabytes, as it won't recognize the four terabyte drive, even though it shows up correctly everywhere else. I've been using HDTune for years and was ready to hand them some cash for the premium version, but it looks like it hasn't been updated since mid-2017. Any other suggestions are similar app that's more current. So, um, now that that kind of confused me because HDTune, uh, the last HDTune that we used when we were doing regular consistent testing with it on our site, which I, I'm pretty sure was HDTune 5, and the reason we went from 4.6 to 5 was because it added support for greater than 2 terabyte disks. I'm not sure why it's not playing nicely with a MyBook external, uh, it might just be a combination of your particular system and the fact that it's a USB external drive, which doesn't get talked to in the same manner as an internal drive. Um, maybe it's doing something crazy like, uh, you know, four kilobyte sectors, which is possible for an external. Um, what that means is normal hard disks, uh, you, in, just Windows since the beginning of time, has uh, done 512 byte sectors and some external drives try to better mesh with the, the, this thing called advanced format, which just means that internally the hard disk sectors for years now have been four kilobyte sectors, no, no longer 512 byte sectors. They do that because the error correction is more efficient if the sector size is larger. Uh, but some, some external drive enclosures just have controllers in them that also try to you know get a little bit more efficient and not try to manipulate a bunch of really small sectors and you know, if you're able to handle sectors that are eight times the size, then, uh, you know, it makes things a little bit easier on it. Um, so that's possible. It might just be something that's not mixing nicely. Uh, but if you're just trying to benchmark uh, hard disks, I mean, honestly, you can use just about anything. Um, I usually use a thing called IO meter. Uh, it works. Um, problem there, though, is that it might not like a already partitioned drive. Uh, that's a USB external, but it should work. Um, just make sure that if you do it, if you use IOMeter and there's already a partition present, set a limit in the sector count. Otherwise, it's going to try to put a test file on the hard disk before it does any tests. And in this case, it's going to have to write four terabytes <laughs> front to back. Um, that'd be pretty bad. But also realize any tool you run, any other simpler test, um, like Crystal Disk Mark or you know, even Addo. Addo is actually probably a good quick test. Um, ATTO, if you're Googling for it, I'm pretty sure it's a free download from uh, from Addo themselves. Um, any of those tools will lay down a very small test file on your drive. And in the case of that drive, it's going to end up going at the, at the beginning of the disk because the drive is empty. Uh, the beginning of a disk ends up transferring faster speed than the end of the disk. Um, Hard disk, uh, hard disks work the opposite as CDs. So, like CDs will read slow at the beginning and fast at the end because they go from the middle of the, the center of the disk outward, and the, the media is moving by faster as it gets to the out, outer edge. Hard disks go the other way around; they read out to in like a record. Um, that means you get faster speed at the at the beginning compared to the end. So, expect whatever results you get for sequential transfer rates, even just moving some files to it can do this, provided just the disk inside your computer is faster than, than the hard disk. Um, you can just copy some big files to it, see how fast it goes, right? Um, if you want to read those files back from it immediately, uh, you might want to restart the system and make sure you're not reading back a cached, you know, because Windows will put that stuff in, in memory cache initially. Um, as, as you know, as far as like evaluating your read speeds, but yeah, you could do simple things like that. You could run Addo. Just realize those results you're gonna get on a clean, empty drive are gonna be, be like start of disk fast speeds. Uh, expect the sequential throughput to fall off 
to somewhere around, it could be as low as like 50% of the beginning of the disk speed. And that's, it, it just naturally just kind of like falls off. It's just a, it's just a fall off curve. Uh, and that's just due to physics, right? It's the, you have less media uh, spinning around at the given RPM, like less media is passing by the head. Um, so you can just, you can't get as much data. Um, you know, and, and as much uh, sequential transfer speed at the end of the disk. But aside from that, the seeks, you know, all that stuff is generally the same, um, you know, regardless of how, where you are on the disk. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I would go, just if you just want to make sure it's working. Honestly, uh, my best bet to make sure it's working is um, use it as your backup and then verify the backup, like backup software but typically have a means of ver of confirming or verifying that a backup is correct uh that's your best bet without going crazy trying to run benchmarks and, and whatnot and you're gonna know for a fact oh okay i verified it I'm, I'm actually able to read that backup back that's the whole purpose you got the drive in the first place so you know you've now confirmed that's able to do all the things you wanted it to do and if you're worried about like is the whole disk good well then throw as much extra stuff as you have you know, make an extra copy on it, uh, and hopefully, you know, fill it all the way to the to the brim, uh, and then you'll know that everything works all the way, you know, all the way to the end. Um, all right, next up, uh, Brisa one one seven. Uh, I'm trying to set up my first RAID array. I have four three terabyte Hitachi drives, and I want to set them into a RAID five array. Uh, after I successfully set it up in the pre OS system, so that's a, that's called an option ROM. Um, that's like the extra menu you get after your BIOS, after your post, and before your OS loads. Um, so after he sets it up there, uh, it still appears to the OS as four separate drives. Uh, am I missing a step, or could you point me in the direction of a good resource for RAID beginners? This is all on an old Asus Sabertooth 990FX board. Okay. Um, generally speaking, once you have changed... You shouldn't see the option ROM unless the BIOS is already correctly configured to be in RAID mode. Uh, so that's, you're probably good there. Um, however, generally speaking, when you switch to RAID mode, the system will usually replace the SATA controller with a completely different device. It, it shows itself as if it was, a, as if you swapped it with something else, uh, as far as your operating system goes. So what should be happening is your OS shouldn't see any drives once you have switched over uh, to RAID. And in the case where you have already configured the array in, you know, in your option ROM, uh, the OS should then see your RAID controller, like, or, you know, your SATA controller in RAID mode. It's going to show up as a different device. You'll need a driver for it. Um, Windows probably has the driver for that built in by now, uh, given its age. Um, so you're probably, you're probably good there. You probably don't need to install a driver. Um, but it should only see a single drive because you've already configured it as a drive. Uh, all I can think is maybe something didn't take properly when you, you know, when you created the array or something didn't, somehow the switch in your BIOS isn't in RAID mode, but somehow you still got the option ROM. It's kind of a really confusing one. Uh, it almost makes me think maybe there might be something like that one sideways with that board or something over time. Um, yeah, it's really, really weird. Um, even the modern AMD RAID stuff, um, even that's kind of confusing the way that they do it because there's BIOS options. You can create the array in the BIOS, but the individual drives still get handed over to Windows, but then there's a driver on the Windows side that puts them together before Windows continues its boot. Um, in other words, at the end of the day, you only ever see just the one volume that you created. You don't see individual drives. Um, so yeah, um, not really sure where else to go on that one. Um, if it was me, I'd probably try recreating the array. I'm sure you might have already done that. Um, I don't know going that far back if they had some sort of software that would be able to do it on the Windows side, like once you're in the OS, but it sounds like if you're trying to create the array before you boot, it almost sounds like you want to boot from that raid. Um, in that case, I'm not sure what to tell you. Um, 
because I, I did it, I did some quick searching for that specific board and people having a hard time trying to get their system set up with a RAID, but the what those people were running into was that they had to install the driver uh, during the OS install in order for the OS to be able to even see the array. And in that case, they would have just seen the one drive, the, the one large drive that they made. Um, yeah, that one, that one kind of has me stumped without having more information um, or like just sitting in front of it and tinkering with it myself, unfortunately. Sorry, I can't be more help there. Um, yeah, I'm just not really sure exactly what's doing that to you. Um, Azar asks, uh, how do we measure Q depth for single threads? Isn't disk IO the limitation? For example, uh, requesting thread must wait until it is until it has received acknowledgement. Uh, I get confused when I hear Q depth 16 thread one or one thread. Uh, usually just you know QD 16 T1. Like that's how manufacturers have kind of shifted to uh, stating what their what their uh, what their spec. Uh, IOPS is like they'll say okay it was at this Q depth it was this many threads right um, I do not understand how it's possible the way I understand it a thread can only make one IO request at a given time wait for acknowledgement and then make another what am I missing uh, so that's not actually the case um, you can have a thread issue a multiple like a multi IO request to Windows um, aside from that even going back to if the thread was only asking for one thing at a time, uh, nothing says the thread can't go and ask for another thing. So it doesn't actually wait for the acknowledgement, or at least it doesn't have to, right? Um, so I coded my own uh, test suite, and I wanted to do QDEP4, one thread. So when I wanted to do that, I asked for, you know, I want this sector. But then... I'm not waiting for an acknowledgement. I asked for three more. When you when you ask for them, uh, Windows does what's called an interrupt request. Uh, it basically, the kernel sort of sets that up for you, right? All you do is all the program does is the API call saying, "Hey, I want data from this location." Windows takes that and goes, "Okay, like I'll take care of that," and then the thread can keep going. Nothing says the thread has to wait. The thread can issue more requests. The thread can go off and do other things. You can have a program that's just a single thread uh, that's not multi-threaded like modern programs would be. Uh, but you can have a single threaded program, request some data, and still be doing other things uh, in, the, in the meantime. What happens when the data is available, like when that transfer has, has finished uh, and the kernel has received the data, it puts it in a section of memory. There's a thing called uh, DMA. Um, the device usually, the device driver just usually basically just puts that data there and then lets the kernel know. And then the kernel, um, through this whole interrupt request process, interrupts that thread on that core, right? Because the thread's going to be running on some core of the system. It actually interrupts it and says, hey, I know you're doing some other stuff right now, but like I got that data you asked for. Um, it's in this memory location over here. Uh, so then how that works is then the program can be coded in such a way that it stops what it stops that other thing it was doing and diverts its attention over to that data that it asked for a little while back and then it gets it so that whole process uh, you know you had a little bit of a misunderstanding on how the process works in modern systems right um because it doesn't have to be uh, just one at a time and it can never go higher now where the number of threads comes in typically in like a system you're actually trying to use is you'll have some program that's asking for data from the drive could be QDepth 1 could be QDepth 4 you know could be different things typically applications will run at lower QDepths um, they don't tend to like issue 32 at a time or something crazy like that um, usually they'll issue a couple of time or one at a time or there might be a couple of different things within the one thread that are asking for data simultaneously. One has asked, then the thread progressed a little more, asked for another thing. Now you're running a QDEV2, one thread, right? Uh, but remember, that's only one program. It's only one application uh, that's doing that. You're running a system. You have multiple programs running at the same time. Now you're running into QDEV something, but it could be multiple threads. 
right? Could be two threads, four threads, whatever. Um, that's where you get, you know, that, that's why I always laugh on the podcast and whatnot about like uh, when people rate their SSD at like uh, Q depth 32, uh, four threads or eight threads or something crazy like that. Because first, you would need an application that asked for so much stuff at the same time. And on top of that, you would be running several of them at the same time. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like why we laugh about that. Uh, because the average Joe sitting at his computer, even power user that's doing like compiles and like some virtualization and things like that, they're not hitting numbers that high. Um, and not only that, modern SSDs that go reasonably fast these days, um, they will tend to do what's called shallowing the queue. So, uh, you know, if the, if the storage device is fast enough, then the threads don't even get a chance to stack up uh, those requests because by the time they go to add another one, the previous one's already been answered, right? Because remember, the computer is still trying to do other things with that data, and it's not necessarily going to need hundreds of thousands of individual pieces of data, uh, you know, per second because it probably can't process them that quickly, right? Um, for me to be able to get uh, even to try to test the manufacturer stated specs, these crazy high numbers of like 128 or 256 things at the same time, I have to write super lean code uh, just to be able to be fast enough to issue that many requests to faster SSDs without them answering the requests faster than they, than they can even come in to even get to that high number of, of things being asked for at the same time. So uh, imagine you know, trying to do that. And the program is also trying to do other things. My benchmarking software is doing nothing but testing the SSD. It's literally spend no other time doing any other thing, right? It's its sole purpose in life. Um, and even I have a hard time hitting crazy high, you know, crazy high Q depths. Anyway, so I hope, I hope that answered, uh, I hope that answered your question. Uh, and, uh, that's actually the last question. Um, so, uh, if you want to ask questions, not necessarily for me, but, uh, you know, cause other guys, uh, Josh does some, uh, Ryan does some, maybe you get some of the other guys to do some, I don't know how a Jeremy, uh, mailbag would, would, would come out, uh, might be interesting. Anyway, um, if you got questions for us, put them in the comments of this video or put them on uh, in the comment section of uh, PC per where this vi mailbag video has been posted to. Uh, and the guys in the office kind of comb through these comments and, uh, you know, Jim does a pretty good job of picking them out and kind of like separating them out, uh, for the various folks to answer. And, uh, you know, I guess I'll, uh, see you in the next one or I'll see you on the podcast or I'll see you in all those other places. Take it easy. I hope you learned something. Mm -hmm.